Welcome to Focus on Art. I'm your host, Barbara cohen -Aar. Gilcrease Museum is one of Tulsa's greatest treasures. And though we often think of it as an art museum, it's really a wonderful tool for teaching and learning. Stay tuned as we look at the museum, a tool for teaching and learning. focus on the museum as a place for learning, then our obvious guest is the Curator of Education, Beth Payne. Beth, welcome to Focus Art. Hello, Barb. It's great to have you here today. It's nice to have you here today, too. And I suppose I should tell our guests that Beth and I have been friends for a number of years, so it's always fun when you get to do a show with someone that you know very well. We just appreciate your fitting us into your schedule. Thank you. This is a wonderful, wonderful place to be, Beth. Tell us about What's happening on the outside of Gilcrease? We own 440 acres here, and we are working on theme gardens. We're now standing in the Victorian Garden, right in front of the Historical Society, which was the original Thomas Gilcrease house. Well, this is a wonderful period house, uh, early part of the 20th century. Is that open for visitors? Yes, it is. You are recommended to telephone and find out what the hours are. They're a little different from the museum's hours. Okay, so if we want to see the house, if we have students of interior design and architecture, since we're focusing on education today, they might really be interested in the house. And of course, I'm sure every person who's interested in horticulture in this part of the state's been over to view your gardens. They're just lovely. Yes, they have. And we encourage them to continue to come. All right. And then, of course, over your shoulder, we have the wonderful uh, museum building. Uh, how are you enjoying the new museum? I know you've done a lot of renovation over there in the past few years and you're just kind of settling in now. Well, we have 173,000 square feet, but it's not difficult to find me. If you need information or help, you can just let them know at the front desk and the all-seeing eye can find me. All right, that sounds great. Well, since this is Focus on Art, Beth, I assume we should get right on over to the museum. Okay. But I'm certainly enjoying the garden. Well, here we are, Beth, at the front door of the museum. What are we going to do first? Let's stop here at the greeter's desk and pick up some information about the mu museum galleries and also look at the special exhibitions that we have. Okay, and all of this is just here for us to take? Yes, it is. Thanks, Beth. Now, this museum is owned and operated by the city of Tulsa. Yes, it is. Is there a charge for coming to Gilcrease? There's no charge. It's literally free. We do have a suggested donation. Well, I'm sure you hope that people will take part in that, too. Yes. Now, the first thing that we see here on my left may be the last place, actually, that people want to visit when they visit the museum, and that's the uh, gift shop. We have many items in here that uh, would be part uh, document part of the permanent collection. Um, you can buy things that relate to some of the images you see in the galleries. Uh, there's many slides, postcards, and books that would be very helpful not only to teachers but to the general public. We have things for every age level. Great. Well, I do bet that this is one of the uh, major stops that your teachers are going to have when they're in the museum. Yes. Lots of information about history and art. Yes. Okay, now we're in this front hall, and when I come to this museum, I think of this front hall as kind of the central distribution area for the museum. You kind of have to know what's on this front hall to know how to get around the museum. Where do we, where do we begin here in the front hall? When you come in, you will see the orientation room. Uh -huh. This is a good place to stop, to look at your gallery guide, find your directions, and go out from here. We have a 2 p.m. public tour every day that is free, mm -hmm. and we meet in this orientation room. Okay, so that's certainly an important uh, point. Now, the next uh, kind of division we have in the front hall here is we have a couple of galleries. Uh, this one over here on my left is what, Beth? This is the Mesoamerican Gallery. 
What kinds of things would we see in there? We'll see uh, some gold items. We'll see uh, some pottery, some very old items. This museum is set up in a chronological sequence, and gallery number one is a good place to start. Okay, which would be here. Right. Now, this gallery across the hall, Focus on Art, has been here many times. This one you generally have your traveling exhibitions in. Yes. Currently, we have a special exhibition of our permanent collection. This will be a textile show. Well, that's a wonderful place to have the traveling exhibit right here by the front door, so people can see that immediately. You know, we might just take a minute and talk about the difference between permanent collection and traveling shows. Yes. Uh, you want to kind of give us some information about which one, what is what? Okay. First of all, I'd like to let you know that we have 250,000 artifacts that belong to us. We have 100,000 wow. books and manuscripts, mm -hmm. and we have uh, approximately 10,000 paintings done by 400 different artists. What a collection. Yes. Okay, so those things make up the permanent collection, and are most of those things on view every time that people come to this museum? We're showing approximately 30% of our permanent collection. We do have the temporary exhibition space, and sometimes we have temporary exhibitions of our permanent collection, which we do have currently. Okay, like the textile show. Yes, Weaving Through Time, 9,000 years of Western textiles. Okay, and normally, if it, I say next year, if I came to the uh, museum, those textiles might not be on exhibit. So if I want to see those, I should come to this show. Yes. Okay, and then other times you're traveling exhibits, uh, have works of art that do not belong to Gilcrease. Right. Okay. Now, when you come down the front hall, you come to this beautiful open space, and this is called uh, Helbury Hall, is that right? Yes, it is. And it's almost like a big hub, I think. Right. Okay, now, if we came to this point, uh, where do we go? As we enter, enter Helmerich Hall, we want to look at different avenues we can take here. First of all, we have our theme galleries in this direction. Over here we have a documents gallery. Currently we have a special exhibition on the Colombian quincentenary. And this is just our celebration of Columbus. All right, great. Now you do have some wonderful masterpieces in this particular gallery. Uh, here's a, a painter that I think everyone who knows anything about Oklahoma art is going to be familiar with. Yes, we have an Alexander Hogue. This is an artist that is still living. He is living in Tulsa. He has many works all over the world. And this is a wonderful example of Alexander Hogue's regionalism. This is really, really is one of the masterpieces of the museum collection. Yes, it is. Well, now we're going to come back and look at the painting galleries, but we want to first look at the museum as a tool for teaching and learning. So we need to go on down the hall here, right? Right. As we go along this hall, we're going to pass through the uh, works of George Callan. Uh, he's certainly an important American artist. Yes, he is. We have approximately 435 Catlins. Wow, and, what a and collection. Anyone who is interested in researching the American Indian and uh, the documentation of the American Indian should come out and use our research library. So you have a library, library with information that supports the artworks that are hanging in this hallway. Yes, we do. I think that anyone that's a history teacher has to appreciate uh, Catlin's contribution to the history of the American Indian. Well, now from here we go downstairs, right? Right. And we're going to be going into the open storage area. We're going to find lots of artifacts to look at and the library. Tell us just a little bit more about that library, Beth. We have approximately 100,000 books and manuscripts. We have lots of rare books, maps, things that document the saga of American history. Wonderful. Now, were these books collected by Mr. Gilchrist? Yes, they were. His mission in life was to be able to uh, document the art artifacts with reading materials. Okay, so you have this wonderful meshing together of visual images and literature. Yes. Barbara, first I'd like to review the way a visitor would make reservations to use the library. Okay, you just can't come in and start 
rumbling through things? No, this is a research library and it's by appointment only. Okay. It's open Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4.45. Okay, and we stop here at the desk and check in. And you do you kind of tell it the library in advance what you're going to be looking yes, for? Yes, you should call ahead, make an appointment, and then the materials that you'll need will be ready for you. You have assistance by a volunteer who will be stationed at one of these desks here, and she will be able to help you from there. Okay, and since we've called ahead, we have a few things to look at. Yes. These are pretty typical of the kinds of things that we can expect to find in the Gilcrease Library. And this is a wonderful group of things. Beth, what do we have here today? We have an atlas here, dating 1522. And well, this is wonderful. I mean, I don't think there are many cities in the United States where one person might be able to just go in and use a document like this uh, as a document for research. What an opportunity. For Oklahomans. Uh, I assume this is hand colored? Yes it is. So in this just one document we have these wonderful small works of art. And here's another map. Oh, I really almost hate to even turn the pages. <laughs> okay what else Beth? We have the Prettyman photographs. And Prettyman was a photographer about the time of statehood. Right. In this area. So we have things that document Oklahoma history. Uh, cowboys roping a steer. Cowboys at home, okay. What else do you have in there, Beth? Which you very carefully turn. Robber's Cave in the Cherokee Strip. Well, we've all probably had a short vacation down to Robber's Cave. You know, my grandfather came in the run, so he probably actually saw these kinds of things like the mud lodge and, and so forth. That would be a great document to use if you were uh, doing a study on American, I'm sorry, on Oklahoma history. Oh, great. Okay, what else, Beth? Well, we have um, Thomas Moran's notes that he made before he did many of his paintings. It tells about the location. We have approximately 2,500 Thomas Moran works. Wow. And this is his own handwriting. Right. This is documenting Spectrus from the North. Well, you have that painting in this museum. Yes, we do. Let's see, it says here he... Uh, Sketches were made on board in the spring of 1890 on a trip to Antwerp. So we have once again this wonderful meshing of the uh, literary documentation of the works of art in the museum. Thomas Gilchrist must have just been a wonderfully intellectual, uh, special man to think that these things would be necessary. He didn't have a lot of formal education. He was practically self-taught. He traveled to Europe and did a lot of reading and encouraged uh, many Indian students that he had in this area to uh, be able to prosper in education. Great, and then provided some wonderful tools for us to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, what is this list of things? This is uh, part of the John Ross papers. And it looks like almost a, a listing of people, uh, perhaps. This is the roll, Cherokee roll. Okay, and this was probably originally all one long sheet that's been broken up through the yes. years. Okay, and the only thing we haven't mentioned, I think, is this one book right here. What is this one, Beth? This is a family tree, and it dates from 1527. Look at the beautiful uh, handwritten calligraphy. And these sheets are just in here to protect yes. the pages. And look at the gold, Beth. This is just exquisite. Yes, and let's take a look at an illustration here. Okay, let me put the page back in here. Okay. Wow. Family crest and beautifully done. Looks like maybe tempera and ink? Yes. Okay. Oh, Beth, these are just wonderful. Thank you for sharing these. 
Now, outside here, we have a very interesting storage area. What's that called? It's called open artifact storage. This is a very unique area for museums, and um, we'd be happy to show that to you. Okay, let's take a look at it. Barbara, you're going to be impressed by our large collection of southwestern pottery. Oh, what wonderful examples, and so much. Right. We even have Maria Potts. I bet everybody's familiar with that beautiful black on black style. Yes, it's very popular. We also have southwestern baskets. Wonderful, Beth. And, and some very old bowls. Okay. Many of these were ceremonial bowls. We also have a large collection of spiral mound items. And you see some very, shell carvings. Right, a very important archaeological site here in Oklahoma. And this just continues on. Right. One of the oldest items that we have in our collection is located over here in the corner. It dates back to 10,000 BC. It's a mammoth tooth. The children that come out here just love to look at this. The very oldest item in the collection. Wow. Complete with the roots still attached. And then some very ancient uh, arrowheads, too. Yes. So you go from 10,000 BC up to the 20th century. Right. That's a reasonably complete collection. Yes, it is. Of course, I'm sure all of the children that come out here love to see the uh, headdresses. They're beautiful, colorful, and a wonderful symbol of the early American West. Yes, and they are excited about the headdresses. We have lots of different programs to offer school-age children as well as adults. We start with the second grade and offer formal tours beginning with that age group. One of the uh, new programs that we have started just a couple of years ago deals with the bison and the American Indian lifestyle. And this is unique just for second grade students. And it's very popular. If I was a second grade teacher, what would I have to do to bring my students to that bed? Give us a phone call. We'll give you some dates that we have open for the program and uh, we'll send you a confirmation before you come, but be sure to call two weeks ahead of time. What's your phone number, Beth? 582-3122. And they ask for you? Yes. Okay, well now, what happens if my children are older than second grade? Begin what choices do you have for them? All right. We have an outreach program that goes along with five of our theme tours, and that is for children in grades three through seven. Uh, we offer a school slides program that gives you an overview of the collections. Um, again, with the third grade tours, uh, they start with 30 minute tours going all the way up to hour tours depending on um, the attention span of the student. Um, first of all, we have exploring the museum, which is telling young students how to approach a museum, how to look at paintings, sculpture pieces, and artifacts and get the most from it how to enter a gallery and read gallery labels, and um, it's very good tool so that they could bring their families back and show them what they have seen for the day. Wonderful. Now, once again, those are things that teachers schedule by calling you. Right. Do you like to have teachers come out and do some uh, work before they bring their students to the museum? Do you have anything to help them uh, if they want to come out in advance? Right. If they would like to walk through the galleries with me, I would be happy to do that. We uh, work with a lot of gifted and talented uh, students, teachers, and uh, that helps us understand what they're studying, and they can be out here for a long period of time, whether it be several hours or several days. That is by appointment only, and they need to call me to set up that kind of arrangement. Normally, if you just want one of the five theme tours, just give our tour coordinator a call and she will tell you what we have available. One of our most popular hours is the 10 o'clock hour, so you'll have to call early. Okay. Tell us the name of those five theme tours. One Again, yeah. we have Exploring the Museum, mm -hmm. Indian History and Culture, we have American History, American Art and Artists, and Treasures of Gilcrease. Okay, well, all five would make a wonderful program for a, a teacher to use throughout the year. Right. Five trips to the museum and do them all would be great. Right. We'll send you a packet of information when you give us a phone call and you can read that and then give us the information that we would need to set up a tour. 
Okay, and how about us oldsters? Now you do have some things uh, for adults. Yes, yes we do. Come to the museum, right? Right. We have a 2 p.m. public tour daily given at the front of the, starting at the front of the museum in the orientation room. Um, you can select one of the five theme tours or one of the special exhibition tours that we have. Okay, great. Well, you're doing a wonderful job educating people in northeastern Oklahoma, uh, not only in the area of art, but in the area of history. Now, we've seen a lot of artifacts in this wonderful uh, space. I think it's time that we go to the galleries and see a few paintings. After all, this is Focus on Art. Right. Okay, so we're going to head upstairs to which gallery first? American Art before 1840. Okay. Beth, this is the Early American Portrait Gallery? Yes, American Art before 1840. All right, here's a familiar looking fellow. Yes, George Washington. Okay, and by a rather famous artist. Yes, Charles Wilson Peel. Okay, we have another Charles Wilson Peel over my shoulder here, and this is uh, James Madison. Yes. This portrait was painted in an informal setting. This was before he was president. And um, to make this very unique, this portrait has been hung at the uh, level of the height of this man, James uh, Madison. You're telling me James Madison isn't more than five feet, four inches tall? That's correct. Okay. Well, this is a wonderful gallery now. This is part of one of your major tours, right? Right. Uh, what tour comes through here? The American History Tour. Okay, and you would look at the portraits and then other things like the Ottoman pictures and Penn's so Treaty. Okay, and that's a very famous painting by right. Benjamin West. Yes. Okay. Uh, once we leave the early American, I keep wanting to call it early American portrait gallery, I'm sorry, American painting before 1840, uh, we come back out here into our front hallway that we've already seen and discussed. And I think you have a surprise for us out here. Yes, we do. As you recall, we had looked at a book down in the archival collection, and we had looked at the notes about Spectris of the North by Thomas Moran. And All here's right. the image. And here it is, a wonderful, wonderful painting. And from Moran to Moran. Yes. Barbara, let's take a look at some of the watercolors of Yellowstone. Oh, these are some of my favorite things in the collection. These are beautiful watercolors. Now, these are finished watercolors. Yes, they are. So these are not just merely field sketches. Right. But he kind of did these in as a preliminary uh, art form to the finished large oil spit. Um, not necessarily. These were just ideas that he jotted down in his um, travels throughout the West. Okay, here's, of course, one of the, I think, one of the most impressive paintings in the collection, the Lower Falls of the Yellowstone. Uh, yes, this is gorgeous. I will tell you, I took my daughter to Yellowstone one time, and I went to the place where he painted this, and I just wanted to see if it really was that colorful, and it was really that colorful. It's beautiful. Yes. Okay, now, will we do this gallery if we come out and take a tour? If you have decided to take the American Art and Artist Tour, you will be able to really take a good, close look at the Thomas Morans. We are entering the Moran Gallery, and we start at this, in this area with a very early uh, time period for Moran, very formal settings that he has here. We're moving into an area where he started painting the uh, Western landscapes. As you can see, many of the breathtaking scenes that he has captured on canvas. Okay, this is Frederick Remington, and he was painting about the same time as Thomas Moran. Yes, that is correct. Let's take a look at his illustrations. To begin with, he was a great illustrator. And to do an illustration for a book, he had to start with a painting. Right. And that would account for the fact that this is a black and white painting. That is correct. Okay. And from the painting, we go to the book. Right. This is a book that we have in our permanent collection. The title of this particular book is A Daughter of the Sioux, A Tale of the Indian Frontier. Okay, now he illustrated this book. He didn't write this book, but he actually did write some books, too. Yes, he did, and we have those on display here, too. Okay, now, of course, we all know about the illustrations, but I think we probably know him maybe even a little bit better as a sculptor. Right, this is called Coming Through the Rye, and Frederick Remington was known for being able to paint the horse, draw the horse, and sculpt the horse. 
And these are wonderful examples of that. The detail's amazing. You get right down here on, on the bridle and every little thing. Gosh, we need to come back and do a, a whole focus on art program on Frederick Remington. That would be fun. Well, Beth, in addition to the sculpture and the illustration, of course, you have a number of paintings uh, by Frederick Remington in your collection. And this is just a great one right here. We might as well stop. Yes, the stampede is a popular one with our volunteers. And those volunteers are really important to your educational program. Yes, they are. We depend on them to give most of our tours. Uh, for your children as well as your adult tours. That is correct. And they go through a long period of, of study to become, a, uh, what do we call them, gillies. Right. They call themselves the gillies. And they are a very important part of the museum. And they give the bulk of our tours as well as greet people at the front door. So we call them our front line. Hey, that's a great group. Okay, the last thing we want to see is one of your artist studios. And which direction are we going to go for that? Let's go around this way. Okay. Let's take a look at the Lee Studio. One of the charcoal on canvases that we have in this collection is titled Zuni Bell. I want you to notice the bowl that she has in our lap. In a few minutes, we will take a look at the bowl that he used to be able to draw this picture. So we actually have real artifacts that he bought, took to his studio, and he used those to incorporate them into his pictures. Right, and his studio is located in New York City. I guess bringing the artifacts to New York City is one way to get the Wild West back to the East Coast. Right. Okay, now everything here actually belonged uh, to W.R. Lee. That is correct. Uh, he used the books as references. He used, um, you can see a badger up here on top of the bookshelf that's very important in the study of that particular animal. And then notice on top of the filing cabinet, the bowl that was in Zuni Bell is located right there, including the corn in the bowl. Wow, that's what we call really ripe corn. Right. Okay. Now over here as we move from the filing cabinet, of course, we come to this table and a wonderful trestle table. This table just as a piece of furniture is an interesting piece and a variety of saddles here. Now this is the kind the Indians used. That is correct. And this one is a, is a little fancier. And then, of course, his art supplies. Now, when was Lee painting? The early part of the 20th century? Yes. So it's kind of amazing to think that we still have a paint in the tube. Right. Okay, and as we wander on through a studio here, we come over here to a very fine painting. Uh, this is called the Close Call. And... Uh, a wonderful example of what he was able to do. Now, Beth, are the dogs keeping the bear away from the guy? Uh, yes, they are. As you can see in some of the images, um, he has studied the dog, the bear, and man. We have seen a glimpse of the skeleton that he would use to study the anatomy of man. And uh, this is a very spectacular scene. Most likely, this did not happen, but could have happened. Okay. Well, Beth, this has been a wonderful tour of Gilcrease. I think that everyone's going to be excited to be out here and to really know about the many educational opportunities that you're providing for people here in northeastern Oklahoma. Thank you for inviting me, Barbara. For those of you at home, we appreciate your being with us. As always, we'll look forward to having you back again for Focus on Art.